All right, good afternoon, morning. I, I don't know. This is weird. This is going to be pre-recorded. I know that hopefully most of you are watching this on a Sunday. So technically, it is good morning. Uh, for us, it is good evening on a Saturday night as we're filming this. Sorry, sorry, our internet is still cutting up here at home. They're going to hopefully be fixing it soon. But long story short, we needed to make sure that uh, you guys had what you needed. And we wanted to pre-record this. But I will be watching right along with you. So I still encourage you to come participate with me in chat and uh, and talk with me and, and we'll be engaging you in chat. Um, but we're just going to jump right into it. As always, you know my friend down here, Pastor Todd, and I am Pastor Nate. And we're just really, really excited uh, to be with you today. And at the very end of our message today, we're going to uh, tell you about some really exciting news about our community and about some new journeys that our two families are, are going to be taking. Um, we're just going to jump right into it. I'm going to open up into some prayer um, and then we're going to start talking about some things that are kind of on our hearts. I didn't get a great title for today. I kind of want to, I like one word titles that are intriguing and make people like, what's that about? And so I think we're going to call this angry. And uh, so today we're going to talk to you about the subject of anger and everything that we know that's going on in our world today. So let's open up in some prayer and invite the Father in again. I always encourage you to do this, but whether you did it before we started today or you do it after we're finished today, find a time of worship. Find a time of uh, putting on some music. To, YouTube's got tons of great stuff. I'm a big Bethel Church fan, and so find a time to turn on some worship. Spend some time with the Father and really ask Him, invite Him in um, to come into your home and, and let His presence be there with you, and we're going to invite Him in with us right now. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity that in 2020, we, you have given us technology and tools and skills that we are able to connect the gospel with people all around the world simultaneously, that we are able to connect with each other in a very unique and different way, that we can experience you individually, but also corporately through videos and streaming. You, you know every need, Father, that is out there. We're going to pray at the end of this, but I just ask that your, your spirit would sweep into our homes you come into our, my home and Pastor Todd's home and every home watching this today. You would just come into our homes, that you would open up our hearts and minds, that you would prepare us to hear your word and that you would challenge us to action in you. I just pray that you would bless your people, that you would answer prayers, that you would heal our land and that your anointing would be upon our conversations today. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said amen. Um, Pastor Ty and I have been talking about this since uh, since earlier in the week and, and really starting to dig into what we were going to talk about today. And um, and really both of us are, are moved to action. I wanted to open up with this conversation that you and I have had often and a lot. And that is that, that Jesus was the ultimate person for justice. He stood for justice in all of the ways, especially in something that we know is extremely important to this new generation that's here into a lot of people, and that is social justice. And Jesus was the liberator of women, of, of slaves, of, of people who were bound up by things. I love this concept of like even outcasts and people that were pushed away by society. Jesus was a liberator of them, the leopards. He would heal them completely and say, go back home and go show yourself to the priest and go reconnect with society. Jesus was the ultimate redeemer and social justice advocate um, as an example for you and I, even in his very short term of what we call ministry. And, and that is a great starting point for where we are today. Share with us some of your thoughts and concepts about Jesus, the liberator and the social justice advocate. You know, um, so that that's just so, that's so broad, right? Because I yeah. think there's, um, I think the best way for me to be able to like articulate it um, is starting maybe from this place of uh, all humanity. 
right? So again, um, if you've listened to any of our conversations, I just have this very strong belief that um, everything really takes place at the garden. Gar the garden yeah. in Genesis 1 and 2 is the very foundation that really starts um, to demonstrate um, who the Father is, who we are as humanity, and what took place to put us on the course of where we are today. So if we just take one quick step back and we look at that, um, you know, there was a moment in time where man was in complete relationship with the father. We were completely dependent upon the father. We were completely dependent upon God. Um, we broke from that um, because we came to a place where we were influenced. And in that influence, we decided through um, a, not a technicality, but um, I would almost say a playing on words for lack of a mm -hmm. better term that we could then um, we could then govern ourselves like God, right? We could govern ourselves just like God. And so because of that, we were able to eat of the fruit that gave us both the knowledge of good and evil. And because we had knowledge, we could come with reason because of reason we could then govern ourselves. So that's kind of the framework that I, that I, I just kind of want to step into. The moment that that happened, the moment that we took that influence and we took it upon ourselves, we separated ourselves from God. And because we separated ourselves from God, we brought on a whole kind of a mess that we deal with, such as like we deal with sickness now, yeah. uh, we deal with emotions, we deal with uh, strife, we deal with anger, we deal with stress, we deal with everything that we deal with in, in today's environment. Okay. I think that so, so one of the ways um, that what Jesus came and did was he became the one that um, that really brought justice to that situation. And more, I guess the proper term would be freedom, right? So yeah. what, what I mean by that is, is that <clears throat> there was a penalty that came with that disobedience, with that knowledge of governing ourselves, that separation that took place. Once that happened, there just there became a penalty that was associated with that, right? That penalty ushered in death of what we now know today. And so so there was there was a consequences from that breaking away and that and coming to the place of self-governance. And I'm saying that to say this is that um, we, we could never in ourselves pay for that debt in order for us to be back into union with the Father. Yeah. Like we were completely incapable of doing that. It's part of the reasons why the laws came into existence. There was the, the reason why no one could fulfill the law. Jesus was the only one that could fulfill the law. That's a very long conversation to have that we just don't really have time for. So I'm, I'm just kind of you know, shortening <laughs> it up a little bit. Um, those are fun conversations. but yeah. When just, do we ever have time for all of our conversations? <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know, I know. And so, um, so I'm saying that to say this, is that Jesus became the ultimate for social justice yeah because at the end of the day he laid down his life and he paid a debt that he did not owe because we owed a debt that we could not pay yeah and because of that because of his willingness and his desire to have humanity come back into relationship with the father he laid himself down as the sacrifice the ultimate sacrifice that paid the way yeah. for us to come back into union and become fully dependent upon the father. That's what we all have today. And it's crazy to go through that process because he did it even with the idea that people would reject him. Understanding fully that they were going to. A hundred percent. Looking through that moment in time where he was and looking all the way into future time, knowing that the act that he was doing, that people would reject him still. Mm -hmm. And yet he still knew that he was going to do it because in doing so, it would bring us the liberty and freedoms that we desire to be back in the relationship with God, the sovereign God, the creator of all things. That's powerful. Yeah. So, so in that process, in that process, he liberates humanity from the sin that they brought on themselves. He liberates them from the from being disconnected from the Father. He liberates humanity from um, the separation, and he unites. So Jesus is always about uniting, right? He's always about bringing people together and under the umbrella that if we do it together as a as a unit, that we would have great uh, further success, greater success as a unit than broken up as individual people, right? 
It, it even yet, goes back yeah. to the principle that you shared last week, and we'll talk more about today, is it's the separating and the bringing together, the separating from our sin and the bringing, you're separating from your sin so that he can bring us back together in alignment with him. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, um, but it, it's a, a piece that you also talked about. So like when Jesus came on the scene, like he was the one that really liber- liberated a, 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 a ladies' movement of that time, yeah. right? Um, as a matter of fact, the two, uh, the, his two greatest supporters, his two greatest supporters were two ladies, right? The first that people at his tomb were ladies. Yeah. Um, um, and I just think about like, so when we talk about social justice, right, we talk about, um, I, I this, this, this is probably one of my most absolutely favorite stories in the Bible. Um, because it, it demonstrates to us, the church, it demonstrates to the world that does not know him, his true character. And that's the lady that's caught in the, in adultery, right? Yeah. She's caught in the very act of it, right? There's yeah. no separation. There's no hearsay. It's not like, well, I kind of think yeah. I thought, it, no, it was, it was a deliberate yeah. caught in the actual act. Right. And so, um, under the law, um, they, they were to be stoned to death. It was just really kind of that simple. And so, um, and, and that, and people may view that as being very harsh. Uh, again, this is not the moment in time to have that conversation, but, but it's really just completely understanding, um, God was showing what a law looks like as a schoolmaster to teach us. Yeah. Like the problem was before the law came into existence is that man never knew that they were in sin in violation with God because there was no structure to it. There was, there was no, there was no, um, there was no ability to go, hey, when you do this, 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 and this, like it's really highly against who I am. It's against my yeah. character, right? And so the way that God was able to show what his character looked like was by laying out what the law looks like. So it's just, it's one of those really long conversations you have to have, but just in the synopsis, that's, that's what it was. So, so, um, so here's a woman that's in violation to the character of God of how he creates humanity. And under the law, under that schoolmaster, um, she's to be stoned to death. Yeah. And so, you know, the, 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 the leaders are there. They've got their rocks. They're ready to go to town. And then all of a sudden, the one that really could do that, the one that could actually justifiably pick up a rock, stone her to death, walks onto the scene. And this is where I think the church has to come to, right? This is our opportunities of being able to walk into situations that we yeah. know sin is there. And this is what happens, right? So Jesus walks up to the scenes. The Bible says that he starts writing things on the sand. We all hypothesize about what that, what that is or what that could be. Um, but, you know, regardless of what it was, whatever was put down made the leaders leave. So whatever it was, they left, Yeah, which gives us then the reasoning that maybe it was something about them personally or whatever the scenario and situation was. Then he says this remarkable thing, right? He says um, to the lady, he turns to her and says, where's your accusers? And I have none. Yeah. And he says, he says, nor do I go but sin no more, right? The, the clause was, just don't go sin no more. Yeah, go change. But she had, she had an experience with him. Yeah. And through the experience that she had with him, her life was changed. Yeah. And my point is, is that today, we're not experiencing him. We're not experiencing the love, the divine character, the divine power of who God is. It's almost like we've put them on this shelf. We've put them on this shelf to say, you're a really good book that I enjoy reading every once in a while, but have no connection to who the author is. Yeah. We have no connection to the experience of what we read, and yet that's available for us. Yeah. Right? So, so in this moment of time, it, my view is, is that this is his way of of interceding into a place of social justice, right? It's his way of coming into a scenario, into a situation that's like, okay, this is the reason why I came. The reason why I came was to set people free. The reason why I came was to bring liberty to the human race, yeah. right? And so 
he's the perfect example of what that looks like. And so um, you're right. We live in a culture today that we talk about social injustice. We talk about climate change. We talk about taking care of, of, of the world that we live in. Um, we can go back to Adam was the custodian of the world, right? That's have dominion, subdue it, right? He was, he was, he had the kingship. He had the, he had the identity of God to be able to manage this world. And so you have a culture today that is in desperate desire to fulfill that calling. Yeah. They're just not, it's, it's just something that's innate in us, right? It's an innate knowing that we have inside of us. And so my point is, is that he came for that. Exactly and he came right. to show us what that looks like. And so right? that we would he experience him. A hundred percent. But but he also did it in a way that he modeled it, right? He modeled yeah. it so um one, we experience in him, and two, we know what how to, we know how to like out of that experience, we know how to show other people. Yeah. Which kind of sets us up where we want to go today, right? And yeah. this conversation around uh, this really terrible event that um, that happened in in Minneapolis in Minnesota, and uh, and I think one of the things that we we talked about today, right, and that we thought would be a really not only where we started, but another really foundational piece that I think is key to all of this, and it cannot be taken out of context, and that is our own personal context is just our perspective, and that ultimately. You, know, you and I have talked about this. Truth is a person. It's Jesus. Jesus is truth. And truth in the way that we view it um, can be very skewed by our perspective. And that truly mm -hmm. two truths can run very parallel depending on people's context and perspective of even the same situation. And I, I had this moment uh, months ago. I, I don't even know why. It just seemed very random, but it was one of these moments where I just felt very humbled by the father and I actually went, uh, I don't even remember what I went for. I, I was seeing a doctor. It was a skin doctor about, Oh, that's what it was. A little spot that uh, like a sunspot that had come on my face or whatever. And I was just getting some things checked out. And I remember sitting in, in his office waiting for him to come and visit me. And there were posters uh, about the way our skin is made up. And it was just like a, a microscopic, you know, one millimeter by one millimeter cut out of what your skin looks like. And I was like, sure. I just found myself astonished by this photo of like, how can I look at this and not understand how I'm fearfully and wonderfully made by a creator? Like that, like just this small, teeny piece of my skin is so complex and amazingly created by a mastermind creator including the way our brains are wired and the way uh, God has created us as a being. I get to do this for work in a lot of ways, but um, the understanding of how we are wired to respond to stress, that it is actually a very primal function that is in our brain that makes us respond to stress to keep ourselves alive in a lot of ways. And that primal function has changed as we have changed and how our culture has changed. And we're not you know, with clubs and hands hunting our food to survive. But uh, instead, that primal function is still there. And there's this concept that we teach um, it with coaches in our program. But not all kids come to us with these age-appropriate skills, right? And, and if we had a 12 or 13-year-old that came into my program and didn't understand how to tie his shoes, I wouldn't scold that kid. I wouldn't tell that kid, um, you know, you maybe should just give up and, uh, you know, leave because you don't know how to tie your shoes. Instead, we would have empathy and we would teach them how to tie their shoes. And we find that easy to do, whether it's people who are suffering from mental diseases or suffering from mental disabilities. We find that easy to do with children, but we don't do it for adults because as adults, we deem that everyone should have the same appropriate adult skills. And the truth is, truth is, is that they don't, that not everybody has the same opportunity to learn the same skills. And so a lot of what we're seeing today is easy to say, whatever label, I don't even want to go there, but whatever label that we may want to put on what we're seeing, experiencing in our country in this moment, even tonight, 
it's easy to label those things specific things that bring ownership to the adult. The truth is that a lot of people on our planet don't get to experience and learn the same skills. And another important piece of this context that we're talking about tonight is the fact that we've all been living under social isolation for two or three months now. And I've even felt it. And there's this thought that even those most healthy mentally of us that have figured out ways to practice self-care and to work out or to make sure we're getting physical activity or to have social connections or the combination of all of those things, even those of us who are the most mental healthy among us have had those opportunities taken away from us. So if even we are struggling, I can't imagine what uh, people who don't have those opportunities are dealing with and have other stresses and other uh, really terrible, traumatic things taking place in their world on a daily basis that now have this added pressure. There's even this research that's coming out about uh, kids uh, uh, being reported for being abused are going down. And, and people may think that's a good thing. It's actually a terrible thing because the fact is that kids aren't being abused less. They're just not around safe adults who can see these things and report them to other safe adults who can do something about that. And so the numbers are dropping because the reports are less uh, because kids aren't around safe people. And so I'm just kind of setting us up that we are seeing uh, – almost the perfect storm of a lot of things come to fruition here as being acted out in the behaviors that we're seeing. There's an underlining core. And, and I know personally, um, I, 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 I kind of fight with this, right? Because all of us in some form or fashion, in some level, have been desynthetized to these videos and this stuff that we all have cameras all over the place, right? And we, we all have uh, abilities to videotape things. And we've all seen things that probably none of us probably should have ever experienced or ever seen. The truth is the more we see these things, the less they bother us and the less that they kind of stir my emotions. And I, I couldn't even finish watching the, the most recent one. Um, but I can tell you that when I did see it, it made me so angry. And I, we've had this conversation, right? Of like, I understand fully both pastor and I, Todd and I are um, probably two of the biggest believers that we fully understand who we are and how we're made. And the fact that these are two white men, Christian men who are having this conversation tonight, but it's important that we have this conversation. This is the conversation that the church is supposed to be having. And I just, as I watched that, I knew that I didn't know what my proper response was, but I knew what it wasn't. And I knew it wasn't to be silent. I knew I couldn't remain silent on this issue. And I felt the anger because I have brothers and sisters who are black and who have to wake up every day. And their reality is when they step out the door and they face other obstacles in their way, that the people that are supposed to be protecting them and serving them may actually take their life. And in even though I'm nervous and I don't like it and it's not an enjoyable experience, I have never feared for my life when I'm pulled over by a police officer and our black brothers and sisters in this country do that on a daily basis. That's right. And I just knew that I can't, I don't know what to do, but I know staying silent is not the option. And right. it just sets us up for this really amazing conversation around what is the biblical response? Like if we, if we go back to Genesis, if we go back to the Bible, if we go back to the root what is the proper response that we're supposed to be happening, right? It is your, your concept of gathering and separating. What are we supposed to be gathering and what are we supposed to be separating for? And, and that is, that's where we're going to go today. And that's the conversation that we're going to go to get. I can't believe we're already like 23 minutes deep here. It feels like we just started, but it, what is a burning desire in Pastor Todd and I's heart is that we create a place and an atmosphere that we together and then individually as we have individual sermons on here and we connect with the Christian people so that we can have the conversations that we feel like the church, the, the thing that God established in the book of Acts that the church is supposed to be having because you and I, we have a responsibility to respond. That's right. That's right. Period. We have a responsibility, I believe, as white people to stand up for our black brothers and sisters and say, this is not right. We demand change. We demand justice. But even more so, we carry the name of Jesus Christ. 
We carry the name, this word Christian, that seems so wonderful to carry around as a badge of honor, which was not a badge of honor when it was created as a derogatory term to separate people and to make fun of people. That word means it comes with responsibilities, being filled with his spirit, being called to his identity, walking in his a purpose in, in walking in this fulfillment of a relationship with Christ comes with responsibility. And that's what we're going to dig in today. I want to go to Isaiah. You, you kind of wrote the scripture down. So I'm actually going to toss it back to you. I'm going to put it up on the screen. I want you to talk about Isaiah um, and the scripture that you, we have here in verse 41 or chapter. You know, 41. Yeah. So it's, it's Isaiah 41, 10. Um, it's just, it's just this amazing, um, before I get to that, I just want to make this yeah. one point that that, that that you said that just is really just resonating with me is that um, you're right. I have never experienced some of the things that my brothers and sisters are experiencing, and that's 100% accurate. I also know that the church gets persecuted yeah. relentlessly yeah. and has been persecuted relentlessly from the time of Jesus. Yeah. And in no way, shape, or form am I bringing them as a correlation to each other. No. But, but in the same token, what I'm saying is, is that persecution in any fashion is unacceptable. Unacceptable. Period. And it's the church's responsibility to stand up for injustice. And we're going we're gonna to step into that in a little bit. But I think one of the things that just going back to Isaiah, and one of the things that I, I just kind of wanted, I just... I, feel like we need to talk about um, when we start looking at what we're seeing on our TV channels right now is that there's a lot of things that are taking place. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of frustrations. And I think um, grabbing one side or the other side and fueling that is not beneficial to anybody. Yeah. And this is the moment in time of like, it's not about reasoning. It's simply about laying down what really is the truth. And what I mean by that is simply from the standpoint of um, what's the current environment, how are people thinking, how are people behaving, and what can we do as the church? And so just kind of putting that into a nutshell and trying to go through it as much as we can in the, in the short period of time. My personal belief at the moment is, is that we are under an enormous amount of stress. Yeah. Right. Society itself globally is under an enormous amount of stress. It's like you said. People have been locked in their homes for the past eight weeks. Some people have not had the ability to go to their jobs. They're worried about catching up on their rent. They haven't been eating properly, right? Their light bills, all those things are, they're going to come due. They might've been able to get them stretched out, but they're coming due yeah. and they're being added up. So you have an overabundance of stress of the current environment that we're living in on top of the fact, on top of the fact that we're seeing our brothers and sisters absolutely going through an enormous tra tragedy yeah. of a white man taking a black man's life on camera, right? It's, it's, the, it's the match that yeah. has lit this. And so now you have, you have a society that is stressed out, that could be hungered, could be worried about losing their home, all these elements. And on top of that, we have this match that's lit and society is just tired of it all. Yeah, They're fearful, they're stressed out, they're scared, and they're just reacting to something that was absolutely horrifying, right? Yep. So all I'm simply saying is, is that I wanna to come to a place of like, okay, let's, so what is biblical? like? What is the biblical stress? I, I'm sorry. What is stress and how does, what's the biblical answer to that? Like, how do we start kind of depressing that down? How do we start getting an answer to that? So um, I think that like moving into Isaiah 40, 10, I think is a great scripture for this. And so for anybody that, that feels like they're stressed out, this is what I feel like the father's saying. He's saying, fear not for I'm with you. And I know that that may feel like just a statement in a book that has no relevancy, but I promise you this, I promise that if you would take time to kneel down where you're at, whether you have a relationship, whether you don't have a relationship, whether you acknowledge he exists, whether you acknowledge or don't acknowledge that he exists, 
I'm simply saying, if you would take a moment and just try it. Yeah. He said this, he said, fear not for I'm with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my right, with my righteous right hand. And I think it's important just to understand that like, um, I, I, what if people listen to our messages the past couple of our talks the pa, pa, uh, past couple of weeks one of the things that we talk about is he's not ethereal he's not over here we're over here yeah. like we're not separated like we're together the bible says he's closer than the very breath that we breathe right so one of the things with stress right stress is like uh, stress comes from not knowing or having chaos or and chaos meaning that yeah. it's out of my control Right. I don't, I can't control it's the it. the ripping away so of I'm control. Stressed. That's right. So, so it's a chaotic moment. It could feel like it's void. You could feel like you're, you're disassociated with it. Like, you know, those are the things that we naturally begin to do. So when we go into the scriptures, Jesus, I, I mean, I'm sorry, the father shows us a great example just at G Genesis one, right? He shows us what happens when we feel void and there's chaos and, and we feel like there's a separation. One of the things that we start to do is we start to gather, we start to separate, we yeah. start to separate and we gather. So we separate the things that stress us out. We separate from the people that may be stressing us out. We gather support, right? We gather, we gather the, the, um, the, uh, emotional, um, um, I want to say desire, but desire is the incorrect word. The emotional, um, when you help somebody, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, you, got, anyway. you got me <laughs> i know i know it's um but it's basically like we're talking about like know, emotional support yeah yeah we, we want to gather the people that are emotional support we want to gather you know we want to be able to gather the support that's necessary to help us get through those things yeah. oftentimes it could be people actually praying we're going to talk a little bit about about that you know it's not about like hey i'm going to pray for you right and then we forget no prayer has to have action in order for it to have meaning it has to cost something remember you know that's something that me and you talk about friendship is not friendship unless it costs each Everything other. Everything has a right? cost. And and I think uh, Jesus says, you're my friend. He does say, if you follow my commandments. But part of that relationship was the fact that he died for us, right? His, the friendship was that he laid his life for yeah. us. That's that, that connection. So um, part of relieving stress is being able to go into your situation, not having fear, understanding that God will be with you, not to be dismayed. Don't let the situation overwhelm you, for God is God, right? And when you come into this place of being fully dependent upon him, it doesn't mean that you can just sit back and go, okay, God, do your thing. That's not really yeah. how this works. Um, but it does mean that when you step into his presence and you give it up to him, that he gives you the ideas to get you out of it. He gives you that peace that's beyond all understanding, right? He gives you the solutions that, that you can... Uh, participate in doing that helps you get out of the situation that you're in. That's the beauty of what God does. He absolutely walks through the situation. So you have victory. So I think that's just really important to, 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 um, to talk about. No, it's, it's, um, um, it's really important in a great place to kind of start of like, this is what ever, this is what people are experiencing. Like we all are wired to experience this way. And these People in, in Minnesota experience this on another level. Our, our brothers and sisters, uh, black brothers and sisters are, are experienced this on like another level, on, on an even deeper yeah. level. And for like, not like this didn't just start, right? Like this is, this has been going right. on for a long, long, long time. And, and it's, it's like anything you get tired, you get fatigued. Um, and I just think back to like Jesus, right? He says, I'm going to give you a new commandment. Like they're asking, well, what are all these commandments? He said, I'm going to give you love one another, right? Love your brother. Do like do these things through love, experience love. And if you think through like how he wraps all of the commandments, all of these things that were so important to them in the law, and he says the greatest is just love. And it just yeah. goes back to being in the church in such a way like again, it goes like love costs. It's supposed to cost us something. And and we know that there are the beautiful scriptures that actually spell out what love is and, and what it's supposed to be, but it just goes to show us that 
It's supposed to cost me something. It's supposed to cost me energy and effort and intentionality and money and time. Like that is the way that we express and we receive and we experience love. And when I experience love in its purest form, regardless of social uh, uh, social uh, economic status is the word I'm looking for, regardless of upbringing and background, ethnicity, it, like all of these things, regardless of that, when I experience love in its purest form, I actually experience God. Right? And that's yeah. what you and I have been talking about, experiencing God. I experience him whenever I experience humans that allow me to experience pieces of his character. And when I experience pieces of his character in its purest form with no strings attached, it actually makes me hungry, thirsty, and appetite, whatever euthanism you want to put on. Like it makes me want these things. It makes me want to seek who this is about. And whenever I'm helping people experience love, they're experiencing a character of him, which allows them to get hungry and thirst after him, which makes them want to experience him, look after him and go after him and pursue him. And we know that he pursues us even greater than he pursues him. And so when we think about what our world needs the most, it is for people to experience characteristics of who God is. And we know the greatest one is love. And that is, that is what ultimately that is what we're missing here, right? That we're yeah. missing just love for humanity in every form or fashion and understanding, I mean, we could rabbit trail here because we've been, we talked for an hour before we even hit record, but like, you know, loving people in a, in, in a truest form. And when we look at the church in the book of Acts, the way it was established by God, established by the disciples who walked with him, who ate with him, who slept with him, who did everything with him, who were right there as they watched his miracles, those people established a community was so sold out for love that they gave, they sold everything that they had, piled it in a big resource bucket, and they said, if you have a need, we're going to meet that need. And that community was added to daily, which probably means that it was added to by people who wanted nothing to do with this religion that they were selling. But man, they needed their electric bill paid. They needed, they needed to, to, they need, they had some needs and this was a resource to have their needs. And through this open opportunity of filling my needs, I now open my heart and you can deposit because I'm experiencing God. I'm experiencing right. his characteristic worked out in his people. And when I experience it through his people, I, be, I begin to get an appetite of experience him for myself. Now I want that. I want what you have. I, I want to be able to allow this to flow through me. This is the way it's supposed to work. And, and I've, I've debated in my head a zillion times because I, I don't, want, um, don't want to be misunderstood. And, and, and I worry about that too much. And, and I know you and I talk about that all the time. But God is not going to remain idle. All the church yells from the mountaintops about meeting in our buildings, which I, I openly admit is important in a lot of different ways. We know that there's scripture, I think a little taken out of context, but they, you know, they never stopped gathering and, and uh, you know, uh, he right. encouraged them to continue to gather. But we, he will not stand idle as we yell about our buildings and we remain silent about the death of a human in broad daylight, video cameraed in front of all of us by the very people who were elected and hired and paid for to protect us. We just That's cannot, right. we can no longer remain silent. And even before him, there's a long list of men and women who live this out daily in their right. every single day lives. And we cannot remain silent anymore. We cannot, I, we just cannot remain silent. You know, I, th I think that there's um, there's this statement by um, Nelson Mandela that, yeah. that I that I really absolutely love. It says no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must be learned to hate. People must learn to hate um, if they if they can learn to hate, they can also be taught to love. Yes, they can. And I think I think that's that's where we're at. I think. Um, and this goes part of into like, we have to understand influences. We have to understand a lot of things that we've separated ourselves from. Um, and and it, the question then becomes this, um, is this the church's problem? 
is this the church's problem because we've backed away from demonstrating what love actually looks like and what it actually is. So you know as well as I do, um, and you can go on Facebook or where we're at, you can go just about anywhere, and you're going to have a group of people that consider themselves to be followers of Christ that will spew out hatred like um, yep. like it's a dragon's flame coming out of their mouth, right? And yet there's nowhere in scriptures that show us that. He definitely talks about sin. He definitely talks about sin from the standpoint that it's it's a manifestation of separation from the Father and that there's a way to reconcile that back. But we also see that every single time where Jesus had the opportunity to condemn someone that was separated from the Father, he never condemned them. He always reunified them, right? He yeah. always brought them back. So I'm saying that to say this is that n- in no way, shape, or form am I saying that it's the church's fault. I am saying, though, it's the church's responsibility to begin to stand in the gap to demonstrate what love actually looks like and how people um, would want to perceive it from being a church or from being a community, a body that's brought, that comes together, right? And so, this is, let's just like, let's look at the, what the scripture says. I love what it says in Isaiah 117. This is in the New King James Version. It says, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow, right? In Proverbs 31, 8 and 9, excuse me, it says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fair, uh, judge uh, fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. So, what do, what what does the scripture say about the church to talk to, to take care of the poor? Right. So, I guess what I'm I, I lost my train of thought. No, it's so okay. I, I guess what, what what I'm saying is is that like where does the church where does the church fit into that? Uh, part of the part of the problem that I believe that took place is that somewhere around the the nineties, the church um, stopped looking at the service from like we used to have the, like the small churches in, in communities all over all over right all yeah. over suburbia things like that, small little churches. Big church, okay, today we we've, we've merged them together to have very large buildings that have very large communities, and we've taken the the aspect of god that were in individual communities brought it into one building and unfortunately that one building doesn't send people back out into those communities to be able to serve those communities so we no longer serve our local community because we've merged ourselves into a building and because of that we've allowed the government to come in and begin to take care of the needs of the people and we the church were the ones that were supposed to take care of that we could go even a step further to say that as Americans, we've now put the onus on our, our city, local, state, and even national governments to, to teach our kids. That is not the biblical way that it was designed. It was the onus on the parent to teach our kids the things that they needed. And I understand that we don't live in the same day and age, but that power has been handed over to strangers let's just be honest they're strangers they may have degrees and they may have certifications but none of us are interviewing our teachers that are teaching our children we've even handed that power over to other people and i just i believe that the father and i know you believe the same he's starting to look for his church not the building not the logo not the website the people the organization the thing he started his people, when he fills us with his spirit, what that he calls the church, he's looking for the church to rise up and to start to take back some of those responsibilities and say yeah. that no more will we let other people do this. And I could go on a complete, like, passionate rant right here that, again, we don't have the time for it, but like, where are Christian leaders that are starting nonprofits, our churches who are empowering people in their congregation who have solutions and passions for the problems that are facing their city, putting finances and governance behind those people to allow those to start nonprofits, to start to um, go after some of those problems with God's solutions and with hearing God's voice and leaning in on his spirit and being filled with his spirit. Instead, 
We, we allow the local governments, we allow local people, people that don't have a relationship with him to, to start to uh, go after some of these problems. And we just turned our attention to local ministry of kids church and uh, worship services and Bible studies and youth groups. And all of that stuff is important. That is not what I'm saying that it isn't important, but God is looking for a, a church, a people that will rise up and say, Hey, that problem that's facing my city, no more. It's enough. Not not a, not another one of that is going to take place. I'm going to step into it. I'm going to listen to yep. you, Father, to tell me what to do. I'm going to step into it, and I'm going to be a solution for my city. Now we're talking about real impact. Now yep. we're talking about creating an appetite for something different, where we are exampling, we are showing that we are filled with his spirit. If he is a river flowing of, 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 of life and giving and love, and that's supposed to be flowing. When I jump in the Mississippi River, you don't have to just try to swim downstream. If you want to swim or not, the Mississippi River is going to take you downstream and you're probably going to That's drown, right. right? Like you don't you don't have to tell the Mississippi River to take you downstream. It's just going to do it because it is a big, powerful, flowing river. I cannot be living with him in relationship with him. Let, uh, it's saying that I have his love and spirit flowing through me and it not flow out of me. It's got to flow okay. somewhere. And, and that somewhere cannot just be our local church buildings. It has to be in our homes, our neighborhoods, our cities. And you and I talk about this all the time. The Bible said a man's gift will make way for me. It will bring him before kings, before kings, right. before royalty, before governance, because that's where God wants to make an impact because these people have problems. Our governments, our communities, our countries have problems that only God can solve. God is the only solution for racism that saves, that is facing our country right now. For these right. people who are just hurting and looking for an answer and just reacting because they don't know what to do, God is the right. solution. And the reason that is being ignored, the reason that we're getting eye rolls when you say God is the solution is because we haven't allowed people to experience him through a real alive relationship, we've tried to let them experience him through religion and rules, and that will come short each and every single time, every time. Yeah, you know it's it's interesting because I think um, you know I think there's there's this other piece that I I, I just want to snip in here and then finish this out by really what does it look like to 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 for the church to love the world? How do we love our neighbors? Things of that nature. Uh, just this one piece that you know what. That when I was in prayer, when I was talking to the father uh, that I thought was really important was, and he gave me this, this one line, it says, an oppressor needs people to oppress. Yeah. Right. And it's really important to understand that we have influence and, and to think that the influence in the garden is still not the influence of today. Then we have misread everything about what it yeah. is that, that happened in the garden, why Jesus came, why we still live in the world today. And yeah. why do we have sin? Why do we have things such as cancer, COVID, stress, fear, anger, all those things, right? Um, humanity were the, was the one that brought those in because we gave up authority. That's what took place at the garden. We gave up the keys. We gave up authority. We know that because the Bible talks about how um, Lucifer, uh, after Jesus comes out of the 40 days, it says the adversary met him after 40 days of fasting, day and night. He met him. And, and there's a couple of different t temptations. On the third temptation, he takes it to the highest points of the kingdoms of the world. And he says, all of this has been given to me. I'll, I've got the keys. All this has been given to me. I'll give it to you. You get down, bow down, worship me, and I'll give it to you. He was offering him a quick way of giving up the keys, right? Yeah. And obviously, Jesus doesn't do it because there had to be an ultimate sacrifice. The point is, is that Jesus never denied it. He never said, no, you're wrong. No, that's incorrect, right? The point to that is that all I'm trying to make is, is that there's an influence that we don't see that influences people. And we have the ability to choose. That's never, that's the, the, the point of being able to choose is never a violation. But one of the things that helps um, in that choice is if, if they, if the enemy can get you to believe that the thoughts that they place in your mind is your thoughts, then there's no enemy. Yeah. It doesn't mean that people are not going to, the Bible says that men's hearts are evil. So I'm not saying this is all a spiritual aspect, but I do. am. what I am saying is that there is a spiritual aspect to this. Okay. So what does the scripture talk about from the standpoint of like, what is that? What, uh, what is the spiritual aspect? 
you know, everybody knows this scripture. It's, it's found in Ephesians. It's Ephesians 6, uh, 10 through 13. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. Uh, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual um, hosts of wicked wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. All I, all I want to point out on that just very quickly is this. We have people that will be influenced to harm other people. Yeah. Okay. It's the church's responsibility to, excuse me, to step into environments and to begin to pray in a way that begins to change atmospheres because we have the authority to be able to do that. Yeah. What I'm simply meaning that is, is that it's not okay anymore to look at a situation. Like let's take the riots, for example. I know it's a very dangerous time and I know it's a very dangerous place right now. But what happens if the church in a way that is um, safe would begin to take a group of people out there, go out there, not to engage, not to engage, but simply to pray over the atmosphere. Yeah. Begin to pray over the atmosphere that this anger and that this um, frustration would begin to dissipate to where there can be dialogue to where we can get solutions. Yeah. Right. Prayer with action. Prayer with action. That's what the church has to do today. That's where we have to go. And so I guess, you know, just kind of, I know we're, we're close on time and, and I, there's just this piece that I really think that we need to bring in to, to wrap this up. And that is, is that, um, you know, we, we have this conversation about loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Right. Yeah. And so we, we like to tote that as Christians, you know, as, as believers, love your neighbor. The, the problem is, and we've had this conversation before, the problem is, is that we have, uh, we have the, the body, the body of believers in all truthfulness that don't even love themselves. Yeah. So you're asking them to love their neighbor when they're fighting depression, they're fighting stress, they're fighting emotionals, they're dealing with behavioral issues, right? And so you're asking because they're not, because they're not experiencing God because we're, we're, we're talking theology, yeah. right? Like the church is definitely behind the, uh, the, the, the concept of let's talk about theology, but you can't talk about theology without experiencing him. So right? much and right because here. Because we're not, it's because we're not experiencing him. Um, we, we have no, we actually have no true theology of him. We just have what we say, what we think is intellectual theology. So you, you cannot love your neighbor because you have no love for yourself. So if you have no love for yourself, if you have no respect for yourself, you're not gonna have respect for your neighbor or your friend down the street or the person down the street, right? So loving yourself, you, in order to love yourself, you actually have to love yourself the way that God loves you, which means that you have to have an experience with God in under, to understand how he loves you. And the moment that you have an experience about how he loves you and you can you can embrace that, you can embrace that truth that you are wonderfully and, and uh, miraculously made. Right. Or I'm sorry, wonderfully and marvelously made. So when you can come to the place to where you don't have bitterness towards yourself, you don't have anger towards yourself, you're not you don't have stress and frustration towards yourself because you understand that you're human, but you're wonderfully and marvelously made by the hand of God in the very image of who he is. When you take that ownership and you take that view of yourself, then when I look at my neighbor, when I look at that person, I can then also love them the same exact yep. way because they're made in the same way that I'm made, which is as the image of God. Yep. All right. So I'll also say this just kind of quickly. And that's this is that the church the church has, has taken such a heavy stance against the sin of the world. And I'm going to say, it, and I, I, you know, this might be the wrong way of saying it. I'm going to say this. The church needs to stop worrying about the sin of the world because yeah. Jesus paid that price. Jesus already paid the price for the sin of the world. His so business. stop worrying about it, right? Our responsibility is to show the world what it looks like to receive the forgiveness of God and walk that out with individuals, with the yep. people that are around us. Yep. And what happened in Acts 
was that they took that ownership of what just took place with Jesus dying on the cross, having full comprehension of what he did. And they came together as a community and said, because of what he did, this is what we're going to have to do with one another. So they sell everything. They bring it to the, together. They give it to the apostles. And not yeah. one person went without. Not one. Now, I'm not saying that we have to go as a body to go sell everything that we have. And the church's that. attitude to daily. Like it was the greatest was, growth strategy ever. And it wasn't because it wasn't because of the outpouring of the spirit of God. It was because of how they treated one another. But it, 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 again, yeah, I'm not going to say that because it, it was simply the anointing of God being exampled and Demi- experienced right, through right. humans who were connected with him and making sure that his character was flowing through him and other humans were experiencing it and wanted to be a part of it. That's right. And so I just have this very strong belief that uh, if the church needs to step, this is the time we have to step up yeah. is right here and right, right now. now. We, we cannot we have to get angry it about it too. Like, like we, yeah, it, it, we, we can't, we cannot stay silent and let, and, and say, right. there, can just, there can't be another one. There can't be one more. That's like right. we have to take that kind of stance in our cities, right. in our States, in our, in our country, like not, not one more section of this can happen. That's right. And, and the church needs to come to a place where we start demonstrating the power of God. I love what it says in first yeah. Peter. He talks about, he talks about seeing the divine character and the divine power of God. Yeah. Jesus dying on the cross was the divine character of God, which shows and demonstrates the love that God has towards humanity. The divine power was through the representation of him dying and being resurrected. Yeah. So you have the divine character in the crucifixion and you have the divine power in the resurrection. And so it's our responsibility as the church to show the divine character of God and the divine power of God. And until we get back to that simple, basic understanding and representation that shows people the experience of who God is, like God wants people to experience him. Yes. Plain and simple. And so, I, I just, we, as a church, we have to step out of the judgment. We have to, st- like the Bible says it, it's right there. But if we start off, 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 if we start off in judgment and we never demonstrate like why the cross came into play or what the cross is about, people don't want to hear it. Matter of fact, we have two generations that are behind our generation that don't want anything to do with it. And we're, we're being able to see that uh, through statistics, right? Have not, they don't want anything. Nothing. Why? Because we don't talk about social justice. We don't talk about taking care of our planet. We don't talk about demonstrating what love really looks like with, with the church being to the people that um, may or may not want to be a part of the church. Right. So I guess to say all that is to this. It's the responsibility of the church to step up at this moment in time and to begin to demonstrate first and foremost, what justice looks like, what love looks like, and what does it look like to be the caretakers of the world that we live in, both environmentally and socially. It's the time for the church to step up and to do something. We can no longer sit back and say that this is okay. No. We have to do something. We have to step into this. It's our responsibility. It is our it, it, last thing is this is the scripture says this, right? I mean, you talked about it um, at the beginning. I guess before we jumped on. <laughs> um, and that it says it says in the scripture it says if my people. So I just want to stop there. When he says my people, he's not talking about people that doesn't know him or hasn't experienced him. He's talking about the church. He says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, ask forgiveness, right? Change from their ways. I, your, your prayers will be heard and I'll heal the land. Yep. It's, the, it's the church's responsibility to come before God and first and foremost, ask for repentance. We got to own it. We have to ask for repentance, turn from our ways hear a prayer and he'll heal our land. 
It's our responsibility. It's every single Christian's responsibility to go before the Father and to let people experience one for us to experience him and out of that experience to let other people experience him. He he cannot take something from us that we don't think is ours. And I want to tie three small things together. And one was a big piece that we didn't get together. But in Galatians chapter three, he says, there's neither Jew or Greek. There's neither slave or free. There's no male or female. You are all one in Jesus Christ. And so if this happens to one of us, we have to own it. And it has to feel just as painful. Now we are, I am not black and I don't know what that is like, but I have to feel that pain as if it were my own, because it is in Christ's eyes. We are all one. We are brothers and sisters, and it is still very mind-blowing to me. I am very elementary. I am very, very simple. It is just mind-blowing to me that it is 2000, it's 2020, and we are still struggling with this. This is still a thing in our world, that we still have people teaching hate and other people accepting it as, well, that's just how they are. That is no longer acceptable. First Corinthians chapter 13 teaches us exactly what love is. It's patient. It's kind of all these things. I go read it for yourself. They're all behaviors that are to be experienced. So if we are, if he tells us to love our neighbor and then I love this in three chapters later, he says, let everything that you do be done in love. Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second one is equal. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. You, like, how many times does he have to say it? Like, does he need right. to write it on our foreheads? Like, it's simple. We are supposed to love our brothers and sisters with actionable behaviors that are to be exampled out. And, and there was this piece that we talked about earlier that I really wanted to get to and we couldn't. And I'll, I'll do it really, really quick. But in Revelation, the Bible talks about how in the last days, the enemy will do all of these amazing works and signs yeah. and wonders. He'll move the moon. He'll do all of these things. And in the Bible, we know that people will stand in judgment and said, we raised the, the dead. We healed the sick. We did all these things. And he'll look at them and go, thanks, but I, I don't know who you are. You got the theology, you understood who I was, you knew how to tap into the power, but you actually never experienced me. You never created a relationship with me. You never had a one-on-one with me. And because we never experienced each other, I don't know who you are. And you're going to have to exit stage right. And and so we think through all of these terrible things that are happening. And we know what the Bible says in Revelation that will happen in the last days. And you and I had this amazing conversation that we got to get to again one day and we'll come back to it. But the fact is that the enemy cannot create. He can only pervert, including the hate and the evil that we see in the world. That is a characteristic of God. God got mad. God hated things. It is a characteristic of God that's been given inside of us. We are to righteously hate things and do something about it. I hate, I'm angry at what I'm seeing, what I know that my brothers and sisters are experiencing. I've got young men. I've got a list of them, young black men that I've been texting this weekend just out of relationship, not because of this, just like these are men in my life and women in my life that like these are good, good young men and women and they get one mistake and their life could end. They could be taken out of context one time by somebody and their life could end. It, it's just, I get angry about it. So anyway, this is, a, this is a characteristic of God that's been placed inside of them that the enemy is perverting, he's twisting, and he's using for evil. And, and the concept was that when Satan comes in the last day, when the Antichrist is raised up, all right, and he begins to do these works and miracles, Will people be drawn to that because they've only experienced the one side of that coin because God's people, his Christians, the people that are called by his name are not doing the exact same thing of signs, works, miracles, and wonders. Even in Moses' day, yes, the, the kings, uh, uh, the wizards and whatnot could, could replicate, could pervert, could create these things or not create, but actually like uh, use smoke and mirrors or whatever like, like magicians do to, cre- to create this facade of that they could also do what Moses could do. But at least Moses was there with the real thing. At least Moses was there exampling the real thing. When God comes back, when when that when the when the Antichrist is raised up, will God's people, will the people uh, in this planet be also able to compare what He is doing with what? 
Christians are doing because we are representing his name because he said you'll do even greater works than the ones that I'm doing. There's just so much right there. And, and so we'll end with with, with some prayer here and, and then we'll, we'll share a quick message, uh, uh, some exciting things that are happening. But I, I, God's people should feel his passion for this. We should feel the onus to do something about this, to stand up and make sure our voices are heard, to stand up and do what is right, to stand up for the oppressed and, and the people who don't have a voice or don't have a loud as a voice and making sure that we're using our platforms. And I have no clue that my voice is the one that needs to be heard. I know it is not. I know that that is a white a male in America that it, I need to be listening more than I talk and I tr practice that, but I also know that I cannot remain silent, that I hope I don't have another great night of rest until something is done because this cannot be a thing on a country that is founded on Christian values, on a country that is full of free, free, Pastor Todd, free Christian yeah. Americans that have a yeah. right and a privilege and, and an opportunity to do something. God, I, 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 ca I, cannot, I cannot wrap my brain around feeling the, the passion to be able to sit in my car in a parking lot of my church building to have service and scream from my right for that and remain silent while people are being murdered because of their skin color. Just can't right. do it. We, we cannot do no. it. And as you so beautifully said, it's time that God is looking for his people. He's looking for a person. I love judges how he was just raising up people to set his people free. He will not stand idle while his people are, are, are not taken care of. And he's looking for a people. He's looking for a generation. One that I think through, and I can be totally off on this. I'm just telling you what I feel in my walk with him that COVID it has has been a physical representation of a spiritual battle that is taking place in our world. And we are Absolutely. seeing the physical manifestation of that through COVID. We're seeing the physical manifestation with that of governments and, and the strife and the division that is coming in. He's looking for a generation of people that will step into this and say, not one more, no more. I will step into this. I will be the solution. I will fill in the gap. I, I will stand in the gap for my people. I will, I will be the Aaron who will stand in the gap and, and say no more. It stops with me. And, and, and that's, that's why we wanted to have this conversation today. And, and I pray that we lean into what Pastor Todd said and that, yes, we pray. But I wouldn't sit in my recliner and say, Father, I, I pray that you feed me today and not get up and walk to my refrigerator and make me something to eat. There comes sure. action with prayer. We can't just pray. We got to put action to prayer. We got to vote. We, 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 we have to support uh, correct protests. Like we, we got to do something. I don't have all the answers. I'm not nearly that smart. I'm super simple, uh, but I know that we have to do something. There has to be, there has to be action to this. Um, and so I, I hope that this stirs you. And, and I pray that I'm going to ask you to pray for us, Pastor Todd, and, and lead us through repentance. But we have to own this. And we have to own what we have allowed to be created in our world and what all of us uh, at some point have heard something and participated in something that isn't right and that continues to feed this, this, uh, this, this motive of, of hate and anger. And, uh, and we have to, as the church, we have to repent for it. I'd love that uh, Job would repent for his children just in case, just in case. Yeah. As, a, as an American church, this is not just an, as a just in case. It's very clear. It's very evident. We have plenty to repent about. And I'm talking about myself. We have to repent for this. That, that We have stood by silently and allowed this to happen. We have to repent. We have to ask Father to heal our land, to heal us, to wash us, and to then lean into his spirit. Ask him what we're supposed to be doing. What is the action? And I pray that churches put just as much passion as you should and as much energy and effort as you do into 24-hour prayer and 21-day fastings and, and whatever other things that as church bodies we call for, I hope we put just as much energy into finding solutions for racism and for injustice that is taking place in our world on, on many, many, many different forms. Just as much energy and effort because the Father is looking for that. Pastor Ty, would you, you know, I know you may have some closing thoughts and, and, and would you, do that and then and then pray for us. 
you know, um, I, I don't not, I'm not, I don't even know if I can get into my closing thoughts because I think I'd <laughs> rather have that law for, uh, for a little for a, a while. I I, I just want to I want to just confirm like it's unacceptable. Um, and the church has has stepped idle. We have we have sat idly uh, idly on the sidelines for way too long. Yeah. Um, to grow our programs, to grow our buildings, and those are fine and dandy as long as they never come at the cost of um, us affecting society the way that we can affect it. And that's through allowing people to experience the father. So yeah. um, this has to change and hopefully it has starts to just with us. It can start with, he, he, the Bible says he just looked in Ezekiel. He says, I just looked to and fro looking for one, one man, um, one man that will be willing to stand in the gap. Um, and he says, because I couldn't find one, I stood in the gap. I put on the breastplate of righteousness. I outstretched my right hand. And um, no, I think that that, that ha like we can do this. We, 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 we could go on for hours more just about that one, that one set of scriptures, just one. Like I'm just yeah. looking for one. That's right. So uh, let's pray. So sovereign God of heaven and earth. Father, I just, I, I first want to just thank you that you would send your son and that Jesus would take that mantle to come and to bring justice to all through his life, death, burial, and resurrection. And that you didn't exclude one person. You didn't exclude one race. You didn't exclude whether it was female or male. You came and you died for all. That's the very foundation of what we live as believers unto you, that you did that for every single person that has lived in the past and that currently lives and that will be brought into the future. It's the fundamental foundation of who we are as children of God. It's what gives us the ability to love ourselves and to love our neighbors as ourselves. So Father, I just ask right now as the church, I ask that you would forgive us. I would ask that you would forgive us for being caught up on the things that of life, wanting to be connected, wanting to provide safe places, wanting to build relationships, but in reality, we've lost the most important thing, and that's experiencing you and experiencing you in such a way that the world looks upon that and says, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to experience him, experience him if it looks like that. So, Father, I just ask that you would forgive us. I really do. I ask that you would forgive us. And that we will turn from our wicked ways. And I pray that you would hear our prayer. And that you would heal our land. Because it's only you that can do this. And so we invite your presence. We invite your spirit to begin to move from the east coast to the west coast. From the north to the south. Just breathe on us, Father, like only you can. You said the wind comes and it goes and no man knows how. And your spirit is exactly the same. So breathe on us. Let us feel your peace. Let us feel your presence. Let us feel your love. And let us begin to do the work necessary to unite our country. Tonight, to unite a people together as one. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. And Yeshua's mighty, mighty. Amen. Amen. Um, and I feel his presence and, uh, and he hurts when we hurt, you know, and, uh, a lot of hurting people we just want to experience him that we, yeah, I know that's our passion for you and I, and for my black brothers and sisters who 
probably dealing with a lot of emotions right now. I know I have coworkers that needed to take time off of work just to process what's going on. And there's so much, right. And uh, much more than, than someone like myself even, even has a right to speak to. And I could just say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that we've allowed this to happen, that we continue to allow this to happen, that this is a thing in our world. And, uh, know that I know our community, um, it's going to be a safe place. And, and we, we, um, we're just passionate about empowering people and, and, uh, embracing, uh, so many perspectives. I could just ramble. Like my, I'm, I just feel like I'm mush because of the father and, and our prayer and our conversation today. But, um, this concept of we don't see color and, and this counter argument of when you don't see color, you don't see the person. And it's like, at the end of the day, whatever is the proper way to phrase things and frame things, we want to create a place that's safe for all and not just safe, like come and, and be here and like serve us, but like a, a place that's safe and that you will be empowered and that we want to hear what the father is saying to you. We want to lean into that. We want to put resources and empower people and, and uh, I just truly believe that God is is going to do something great through all this, and that there's so much negativity in the world because the enemy understands what God is trying to do, and He's doing everything He can to distract us from walking into that and stepping into that. And I know that's our passion for you and I, Pastor Todd, to step into that, and we're going to do that. And so, thank you for the conversation today, and um, I just pray that. Our brothers and sisters across this this country um, feel God's love and have His protection and uh, His strength, and uh, and as a church body, we we all step up and we stand next to one another. We truly support each other during this really unique time in our country for all of the different reasons. Um, very quickly, I know that we're we're over time. Oh, please. No, I was just going to say, you know, the one thing is, is that I think that the, 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 a great way of, of uh, framing this is that we celebrate every culture. Yeah. Right? We celebrate every culture. That, that's just one thing that I think that um, we've always done really, really well as a community is to celebrate uh, individual, where they come from, um, your, the culture. I think it's really, really important that we celebrate people's cultures. Yeah. Uh, because if you don't, if you if you say that you love a person, but you're not willing to celebrate their culture, then how much love do you actually have for them? Yeah. So uh, that's just what I wanted to say. No, it's so true. Um, so to the announcement that we asked people to hold on for again, um, uh, let me just wrap up with this last thing, and, and then we'll get to the announcement. Uh, and that is that we're going to be more intentional about uh, wrapping up our sermons, our conversations, when we're together um, with an action. And your action is to put action to your prayer, to find some way to get involved, to empower the right voice for justice, and for the right thing and for safety. And so that's your challenge this week. Um, and then the big announcement, and uh, that is that um, we're going to be undergoing some changes and uh, our two families are both stepping into something that's been uh, behind the scenes working on for a couple of months now. Um, and we've been just trying to through it and walk through it and, and also being very understanding of COVID and, and where we all are. But COVID has created this really unique opportunity to do what we're doing right this moment with you right now. Um, and that is with virtual experiences. And it, uh, for years now, Pastor Ty and I have been walking alongside one another, um, trying to figure out what it is that God was doing in each of us and doing in our families and, and why he brought us back together for this moment. We always believed it would be for this movement that he was wanting to birth out of, of the city of New Orleans and, and you know, this movement that would really begin to impact a, a whole entire generation that's coming up that both of us have kids in um, that are really looking uh, for something more and something uh, authentic and real and that speaks to the things that they're very passionate about. And uh, so starting next Sunday, July, June, not July, June the 7th, uh, will be the launch day. So next Sunday will be the launch day for an, or a, a, a community that we're creating called Home Church. Um, Pastor uh, Todd and I uh, have been, again, praying through this and, and leaning into the Father 
And uh, we were are going to be very heavily influenced uh, by Bethel Church out of Reading. If you or, or uh, if you understand them, or if you you have knowledge of them, if not, you should check them out. They're really super amazing. Um, and next Sunday, we will share some of the vision of how we got to where we are and what home church will look like. That name is very intentional for a reason, um, and we believe that not only people here in New Orleans, but really people. Um, our vision is uh, all across the world and country uh, will be able to uh, be a part of home church. And we're going to do it in a very unique way that embraces technology, um, that embraces uh, community based uh, churches, um, that embraces uh, getting us out in our communities, in our neighborhoods, um, reconnecting with people so that we can meet their needs and so that we can uh, usher them alongside a relationship with Jesus Christ and in a really pure, unique, and, and um, awesome way, in our opinion. I, I do believe the scripture, though, there's nothing new under the sun, but I believe that this is a new twist on what the Father is doing in 2020. And so I'm really excited, uh, very scared, <laughs> very passionate, uh, all of the emotions that I possibly could have that Home Church will be launching next Sunday and uh, both Pastor Todd and I will really share um, what led us up to this point, uh, what home church will look like, what will be different and unique about it. And uh, we hope that some of you will come along this journey with us. And so uh, next Sunday, we'll launch home church and uh, you'll see some things that will come out about it this week. And uh, we're just really, really excited about it. And uh, I'm excited that my friend and his family will be along this journey with my family and I. And uh, it is engulfed our world and I uh, can't stop thinking about it and praying about it and excited to step into it and see what God ends up doing with it. So uh, next Sunday, I hope that you join us and uh, and come and, and listen to the vision uh, about home church. We'll start changing some of these logos and whatnot over to home church uh, stuff. And uh, I'm just really, really excited. So next Sunday will launch. And uh, today, if you're watching this on Sunday morning, uh, I'm in chat. I've been engaging with you. So I hope that you engage with us. And every Sunday, uh, whether it's a sermon or, or whether we're here together, um, there'll be someone that will be engaging you with polls and and uh, chat and questions. And that we that's ultimately what we want. We know that sometimes you, you may just turn this on and be fixing coffee or making breakfast and doing your thing. And, and you totally have that space. But if you're here and you're in front of your computer or your phone, we we want you to engage with us because ultimately, as we've talked about so much today, it is truly our passion, and that is that we experience Christ with each other, um, and that does, that happens through engagement. So thank you for being with us, for staying a little long, uh, and, and Pastor Todd for just amazing conversations today that um, I hope don't just become a sermon that we listen to, but become a lifestyle that we practice um, because our world desperately, desperately needs it. So um, for, for Pastor Todd and for myself, thank you so much for watching today. We love you. Have a very blessed week. We'll see you next Sunday. Have a good one. Bye-bye.